Good evening, everyone. And welcome to this first service of our communion weekend. A special time for all congregations because we give particular focus and emphasis to the essentials of our faith. That Christ died for our sins and that he rose again on the third day according to the scripture. And that's very much the heart of our communion weekend, that we <coughs> want to enter into real communion with God. And that's what we'll be doing, building up to the communion service. We gather as a community of faith. Some of you might have a lot of faith, and some of you might think you don't have much faith. But the purpose of the preacher behind me, of the way, is to build up your faith, to enlarge your vision of Jesus, and to come closer to the Lord. So, if I, so that's my expectation of him anyway. And we spare no expense in bringing you the best ministry, near and far. And tonight is no exception. Our visiting preacher, Pastor Chris Simmons from the Vita Church in Brighton, is um, a man of over 30 years of ministry, a church planter, and a man of mission in many nations. And I've heard some of his stories, wonderful stories indeed. And I first met him about four years ago at a conference in South America. As you do, you know, you just bump into people in South America in your travels. And there was a group, uh, I'll say very little, maybe we'll explain more in the story tonight, but there was a group of pastors from England and I was the one from Scotland, and we got sharing and talking about wh what our heart's desire was to see a move of God, the Spirit of God moving. But as Chris was sharing, <coughs> uh, he, he knew a lot about Lewis which for an Englishman is quite remarkable, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> but he knew a lot about the Lewis revival. He knew all about many aspects of it, and I was really impressed. And uh, I felt in my heart then, you know, we're, you're going to be here in the, uh, in the Isle of Lewis yet. Now that's almost four years. I, I forgot, in a sense, all about it until about a month or so ago when it was time to think, you, you begin to pray, Lord, who shall we invite for the communions? And I just happened to see something that Chris had posted on his Facebook page, and that's your man. So there's lots of expectation on this man after this billing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lord. But thank you to those who've joined with us tonight from across the island, from Lurebust, from Barvis. Just come in. Thank you, friends, for joining with us. Anyone else from across our beloved island who's, who's joined with us? And we want to thank five intrepid warriors and visitors who've come with Chris. Uh, they came last night for a few reasons. They're intrigued by the Highland and the Hebridean adventure, and, but they're also, I believe, here to keep an eye on their pastor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see a nod from, from <laughs> Chris. Just, just to see how he goes. And today, you know, today we've had a wonderful day uh, touring. I, I, I really enjoy showing folks the island, some of the points that are precious to us. And uh, we've had an excellent day. And we've had a couple, two very, very special moments. We would say a God-given moment for us. We, we will share these later on with you, please. So tonight, after our service, we go through, and the ladies have prepared a wonderful spread of, of food, various food. So please, as many of you as possible, come through, and we'll have a wonderful time of praise and testimony and it's a time when we just make it up as, it, as we go, as the Spirit leads, so to speak. So thank you all for coming, and I pray that you be blessed. And of course, we welcome everyone online. Please enjoy our communion weekend. So let me now hand over the service to Chris Simmons. Thank you for that. Thank you for that amazing introduction. <laughs> and uh, just to say it's joyous on... Uh, I've got some folk from our church here. It's a, it's, it, we are so happy to be here this evening, to get here safely and easily, I might add, all the way from the south coast um, of the UK, and really looking forward to this weekend. And we've already seen uh, something of uh, the Isle of Lewis. And let me reiterate, if you're able to come this evening, please do afterwards. We'd love to meet you and you can meet some of our uh, folk from here. Like it or not, Lewis, the Isle of Lewis, Barvis is known <coughs> all over the world, in the Christian world. When we were in Bogota, you are known in Bogota in South America. You are known wherever there are hungry hearts, uh, Christian hearts looking for the breath of God to breathe again. And that's our prayer for this weekend. 
that whatever I say, whatever I do would be inconsequential, quite frankly. It, uh, th there would be a meeting uh, once more. Uh, the, the breath of the Holy Spirit would breathe over the, the apostolic words uh, that we'll be preaching from 1 Corinthians. So that's our aim, that's our hope, and thank you for having us and thank you for inviting us. So why don't we stand and let's start with the first hymn, How Great Thou Art. Mm -hmm. this and over all of us. And Paul says this, I kneel before 
the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derive its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how high and wide and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him, to him, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand to sing the great Welsh revival song, Here is Love, Past as the Ocean. <laughs> Sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. 
Not many of you were influential, not many of you were noble, of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. If you'd like to stand, we'll sing the next hymn, Amazing Grace. particular passage, uh, if I may, tonight. Uh, we come from a, I suppose, a, a, a city that is almost an island to itself in Brighton and Hove. It's a city I moved to 20 years ago. 
Um, I was born in the middle of England, in the UK. I've married a Siberian wife, a, a wife, uh, Natasha, from the middle of Russia, who I met on a ministry trip um, 20 years ago. So I was on a ministry trip, and there I met my wife. I have two children who keep me busy, uh, two girls. One is 10, uh, the other is 5, so we're, we're, a, we're a busy... You, you know those of you that are family people, getting them to school, picking them up, looking after them when they're sick, you know, trying to form them and everything else. But we have a great family life, a great church. We're a family church, really, uh, in Brighton. And uh, a Christian church. And, of course, in, in being invited here, I said to my wife just a month or two ago, I, I said, don't worry, this year I'm going to stay at home, you know, because preachers... Sometimes you get invited here and there. And I, I told my wife, I said, no, I'm, I'm going to stay at home. I won't be traveling. I've been here, there, and, and everywhere for one reason or another, you know, post-COVID. And then uh, you invited me, Duncan invited me to uh, this island. And it would be impossible for me to say no, given <laughs> your history, given what I've read about it. And the strangest of circumstances to meet someone from this <coughs> island... Um, in uh, Bogota, Colombia, again, uh, another city that's well known uh, today for the revival that's happened there. And I'm sure Duncan's shared a great deal about that um, over the years. So it was, it was a, just a wonderful invite. Um, it's, the, there are two places I want to visit in my life that I haven't visited. One is here, the other um, is Israel. And I will be visiting Israel with my wife later on in the year. So when I say it's a joy to be here and I want to be here, um, that is absolutely the truth. I was saved when I was 19. Uh, like many uh, salvations at that age, I was in mental torment, I think, for a week. Some of you will understand what that feels like when you're brought to Christ. I was in a tug-of-war battle with God for a week. I was raised a Catholic. I understood some, something about Jesus. I wasn't even the first time that I'd heard God speak to me, but he spoke to me when I was 19 and he asked me for my life. And that was a difficult decision at the time. How stupid are 19 year olds? That tug of war battle went on for a week. And eventually I said, Lord, what do you want? He said, I want your life. And I said, okay, you can have my life. I'd rather that. He reminded me of the consequences of saying no, I should say that. Um, I was given... The Lord said to me, you can say no to me, but the consequences of that no will be a lost eternity, an eternity in hell. And some people understand that, some people don't, but I believe that absolutely. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And I said yes to Jesus at the moment. I said yes. I was filled with the inexplicable joy of just belonging. Everywhere I went, I belonged to Jesus. And that, that has come and gone, but it's... It's never left me. It's never left me the joy of belonging to my Saviour, the joy of knowing that, uh, you know, one day when this life ends, life will continue. One day we will be together, those of us that know Jesus, forever and ever. That incredible joy of knowing him. And so that's, that's, that was my story back then. And for one reason or another, I went to a... I wasn't prepared to do all this. I'm going to share before we come into the text so you, you get some idea of me. But I was given, I went to a Christian bookshop with a rather austere older man. And I made the mistake. I, the first book I ever read, I said, would you recommend a book? And I al almost immediately thought, I wish I hadn't asked him that question. But he, he, he gave me the most boring looking book. And that book was, the, was, a, was a book of revival. It was the Welsh Revival. After that, I read the, the, the one that was in the Hebrides. But I read that, and it gripped my heart. And revival gripped me from the get-go, that this is God's way, this is his only way, that his church is meant to grow and can grow. And I don't know what the Isle of Lewis is like, particularly at this juncture, but I do know what Brighton and Hope is like. Um, in the main, we have rejected Christ as a culture, we're increasingly rejecting Christ as a culture. Maybe 1% to 2% of my city of 300,000 would go to church on a Sunday. And believe me, the church has tried everything. 
It's tried bigger churches, it's tried better worship, it's tried to be more beautiful, it's tried to be attractive, it's tried to offer courses, it's tried everything. It's tried everything that man can do. And man cannot do God's work for him. It is only his work. And we have to go through him. We have to go through him. As I remember many years ago, uh, Peggy or Christine saying to their local minister in Barbis, we have to go through him if we expect God's results. And that's what we read about in Scripture again and again and again. And that's what grips my heart. It, it has to be the breath of God. It has to be him that does it. Because we cannot, no matter how hard we try, we have to lower ourselves and humble ourselves to that. So these verses of Scripture that I've chosen really aptly describe the Apostle Paul. They aptly describe what the church should look like. And it isn't music to our ears. It isn't music to the church's ears. It isn't music to new Christians that God, that Paul would describe this. This is what it's like. And so when Paul came to Corinth, and remember if you know the story, Paul has come to Macedonia through a vision. He's come to Europe because God told him, go to Europe. He was actually planning, I think, somewhere in Asia. But he, he came to Europe, and he, he's in Athens, and he comes down to this city of Corinth, which is an immoral city. It's a prosperous city. It's a, a Roman greco-roman city it would intimidate anyone and it intimidated paul make no mistake he he didn't come to the city feeling he had the goods feeling he knew what to do feeling this is a city that that does not have a church even this is a city that's never heard about a man who was crucified on the cross this would be ad 50 ad 51 so jesus died only 20 years before they don't know. They're steeped in Aphrodite and the Greek and Roman gods and gladiators. It's a terrible world. It was an awful world before Christianity arrived, before, before Jesus' good news was announced. And it nearly broke him. Paul said, I came to you um, in weakness, in fear and in trembling. Paul was fearful. He was fearful to come to this city. He was fearful to... Um, do. I, I would probably say today that if Paul was to seek medical help, they would probably tell him he needs six months off, he's close to burnout, he needs antidepressants or something. It stretched Paul to the limit. And Paul tells us why it stretched him to the limit. Because it wasn't about him. God had to reduce Paul to the end of himself so that he could see that it was only God that can do his work. And I don't know, but if I was to guess, looking at the Western world today, I would say God is doing the same thing. The church is growing weaker perceptively. It, it, it's growing weaker. Why? Yeah, I think of the answer, so that no man may boast. God doesn't want to work through a strong church. He wants to work through a weak church. He wants a church on its knees that's, that's utterly and completely at the end of itself. That says, I do not know what to do. I've tried better preaching. I've tried different worship types. I've, I've tried to make the church look nicer. I've, uh, you know, we've put great adverts. And still, I think that's, that is how God always works. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. That's what we read about, I think, in the New Testament. This is how God gets glory for himself. And of course, on your island, like it or not, and I can imagine if I was living here as a Christian, I might get sick of tourists coming, wanting to look at the church or talk about the revival. You know, we, we met the... the, the I, I can't tell you the joy of meeting the Reverend MacLeod today at 96. Why? Why? Because we want God to do it again. We want God to move. We want him to move. And we know that in of ourself, we cannot make him move. We cannot make him do anything. But we can ask. We can humble ourselves. We can reach the end of ourselves. We can't convert anyone. You know, I've, I, I'm praying all the time for my daughter. 
You, we can't even convert our own children. God has to do this work. It's a work of God. Everything is down to him. So I love the Apostle Paul, who in, in certain ways is, is disdained in our culture for this or that. And I think, you, you know, when you understand this man, th this man absolutely understands Jesus. And he understands what it's to look like, what the church is to look like. And I, I, I of course, have seen the church around the world a little bit. I've, I've, I've seen the Western church that promotes itself to high heaven when Paul never did. Uses every means possible to try and make itself more attractive. It isn't working. I mean, you can read the book. Of course it doesn't work. Of course it doesn't. It'll, it'll never work. Unless we do it his way. And God shows us how to do it his way. And what he wants from his people. And, and the reason I say it's not music to the ears of anyone. is because who wants to be. You know Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Who are somewhat arrogant. And proud. And think they've arrived. And think they're super spiritual. And they speak in the tongues of angels. All of these superlatives. And their main problem, actually, is they reject Paul out of hand. They're full of orators and talkers and speakers and these gra people grandiosing up themselves. Super apostles, Paul calls them. Paul doesn't look like a super apostle. Paul is incredibly eloquent in his speech. Paul doesn't, I don't think Paul is a tall, six foot two, handsome looking dude. Even if he was, after he's been beaten, Several times his back would be doubled over. The pain that Paul would have experienced, I can't imagine. Paul doesn't look like the super apostle that you're meant to be. He doesn't, I suppose, in any way mimic or imitate any of the Roman or Greek gods. Uh, because our God doesn't either. Our God looks ridiculous. As, as, as Paul says earlier, if, if you're a Jew or, or a Greek, to the Greeks it's foolishness. Man on the cross? You worship a man who died a humiliating death on the cross? You would worship him? That's foolishness to the Greeks and to the, to the Jews. It's a curse. It's a curse. They, they don't understand it at all. But Paul does understand it. Paul absolutely understands it. And his correction to the Corinthians and to us is that we must understand it too what Jesus is really like, what he's called us to be as a people. One of the things I love, and I've, I've read and listened about, you know, what is the character of, of people um, who led this revival and listened to uh, again and again Duncan Campbell over the years, it grips me deep down, is the humility, is the humility and the, the, the passion for God and the fear of God. And if the church in my location needs anything, it's some of what you've got. The modesty, the humility, the, the lack of presentation and desire to point to me or point to my church even. Because it's wrong. Every time it's wrong, we point to Jesus Christ. We point to a crucified God who died for the sins of the world. Who died for your sins. And you know, I'm speaking to you tonight, I have to say... If you are not sure that your sins are forgiven, if you're not certain, because I, I will tell you categorically, you are a sinner. You're not worthy to go to heaven because you're, you're a good person. Don't believe that. You're a sinner. Are your sins forgiven you? Have you taken, have you taken what Jesus offers? Because he died on that cross for your sins. And if you will accept that, if you will come to him for that, he will forgive you your sins like that. In a moment. It doesn't matter whether you've sinned a lot or a little. And at 19, that was hard for me. And I don't know whether, you know, you, you've all done it. It, w it was a difficult decision for me because I was arrogant and I was proud and I wanted to live my life. And who is this God to tell me? And today I thank God that he battled with me and, and, and just fought with me battle of course that he won and today I know as I know as I know I can preach to you with absolute confidence in this book about Jesus Christ and so what Paul is saying 
isn't good news to the Corinthians. Not a bit. Not a bit. You're the foolish things he's telling them. Not many of you were of noble birth. Well, they don't want to hear that. See, the Corinthians think that they are somebody. Um, they've had this amazing spiritual experience of God. They, they, they are able to speak in tongues. And, and it's gone to their heads. It's made them arrogant. And they, instead of imbibing the lowliness of Christ, the servant heart of Christ, instead of lowering themselves, what they've done is they've elevated themselves and think too highly of themselves. And Paul, like a good pastor, is correcting them, trying to correct them, trying to bring them back to who Jesus is without killing them, without condemning them, because Paul loves them. These are his people. They're converted through his ministry. They're rejecting him. Imagine that, that you've converted all these people. You've brought them together. They're coming to church and they don't want you. They're too arrogant. They, they just don't think you're quite right for them. And I would probably say that if the Apostle Paul was to come into much of the Western church, he would be rejected today as well. He wouldn't look right. He wouldn't sound right. He'd, he'd be far too radical. We need to take to heart these things. These are at the very heart of how revival and what revival is meant to look like. Because make no, you know, God is going to move again. Who knows how and when? The Spirit's here tonight. And the breath of God and my prayer tonight is that we'd be encouraged. I want to, I'm an encourager. I want to, to encourage us. And also to understand that the weaker we are is not a bad thing. The revival that happened here several years ago was because of desperation. Two old ladies and others, they're desperate, desperate, because it's not working. And when you've got that in your soul, when you, when you understand what God can do, you can never let it go. You can never walk away from God doing this thing. You want God, of course, to come back and do this amazing thing. And so when Paul's confronting them, not the lowly things, the despised things, the things that are not, he's, he's really confronting their arrogance and pride. He's saying, you're the lowly things. You're the things that are not. That's us in the church. The lowly things, the despised things. As much as we want to change, as much as we... You know, and I, you know we, we want to present ourselves to the world as being you know, humongously successful and everything else. We, we understand that God chooses us for reasons that we don't always understand. But we are to represent him well. We are ambassadors of the living God. And we represent him well when we point to him and away from us. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of everything that he wants to do. And so he gives this status. I want to look at that status that he gives us as Christians and then to, to again look at, well, what, what does that look like in, in how um, we're meant to live? And the status here is given, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption, he says. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, in verse 30, who has become for us wisdom from God, righteousness, holiness, and redemption. It's his righteousness, his holiness, his redemption that we receive, not our own. That's the point that Paul's making to them and is trying to get them really to, to um, fully understand. And just to unpack them. So the righteousness of God, this is the good news. If you're a Christian, you're not guilty. I mean, Doug, does anything get better than that? That one day when we meet the maker of heaven and earth, not guilty. Chris Simmons, not guilty. Chris Knight, not guilty. Not by virtue of anything we've done. It's his righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's what Paul's saying. To, that's what he's trying to get across to them. That it's, it's it, the, 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 the verdict that would otherwise condemn has been taken away. Someone else has taken it on themselves. Jesus took our sin away. He took it on himself. 
Now, you can keep your sin if, if you haven't ever acknowledged that, or you can take your sin, or you can ask Jesus to take your sin from you, which he will do in a moment, because that's why he came into this world, to save, to save you, to save us. The th second thing he says, that, well, it's holiness, you know, that, that, that it's his holiness, that we become like him, that um, not because we're trying hard to be better people, Oh, I've stopped smoking and drinking. I'm looking more the part now. No, nothing like that. His holiness is so incredibly attractive. His holiness is, is so desirable. Prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors wanted to eat and drink with him. His holiness was so incredible that, um, you know, that the religious people just didn't understand. How come, Jesus, you're eating and drinking with sinners? Because he's come to save the lost. It's attractive. People love to be near Jesus. The hardest thing, I, I, I suppose, for us in the church, in the city I live, 1%, 2% go to church. We're at the lowest ebb we've ever been at in my lifetime in the church right now. Trying to be a friend of sinners, trying to proclaim the truth like Jesus. We don't do it anywhere near as well as him. And we need more of the spirit. We need the breath of God to come and save more people. We need the breath of God to breathe in the secondary schools, in the primary schools. We need the breath of God at work. We need the breath of God to come and redeem and to save and to heal and to do what only God can do. And I believe he's going to do that. And then we take this book seriously to look like him, to be like him, to be ambassadors of the Most High God. One of the reasons I love this place is it's, it's self-deprecating, it's modest, it's humble. All of those things have been put into what Christianity is formed and shaped like. Some of the areas where I'm coming from, it's just the opposite. It's how can we grandiose our church? How can we make it bigger? How can we make it more attractive? How can we, how can we speak ourselves up? How can we talk about this? How can we show reels constantly of this, that, and the other? And it's not God. It isn't glorifying him. Jesus likes and, and, and says that about himself. We'll look at a minute just how humble he is. Well, let me tell you, the, the church has been in a worse state. It wasn't great in 1949. It isn't great today. God has a, a way of wanting his church weak, you see, because then he'll move. Then we don't boast. Can you imagine if we had a church of 500 or 1,000 with, with a great building and great worship and, and known and, and, and everything? And does that help? I think it, it so easily leads to, to the wrong thing, to arrogance. <coughs> well, in, in uh, Wesley's day, in the um, 18th century, um, this is a... A brief description by, in 1738 by Bishop Barclay. He says, to a degree that was never known before in any Christian country, he's saying that religion and mor morality in Britain had collapsed. Across the whole of Britain, collapsed. Um, church leaders who were godly were replaced with liberals. So that led to a total extinction of, of sort of biblical thinking in the churches. Many, many uh, sound, godly men just left for the new world. And uh, what a blessing they were there. Um, clergy weren't allowed to meet together. The slave trade was, was at its height, monopolizing abuse and greed. Can you imagine the slave trade? Imagine its abuses. In every single strata, it was horrendous. That was going on. It was making people rich just to eradicate it, just to stop it. The mortality of children was terrible. The figures we have, three out of four children died. It was called the gin age. Poverty, violence, prostitution and murder followed. Brothels were everywhere. There was no provision to educate the poor whatsoever. And then God sent his spirit. God began to change my country. And suddenly, within a hundred years, we're educating children across Britain. We have schools. The slave trade is abolished. Why? Because God came. Because God came. 
and preachers preached the good news of Jesus and people became Christians. It really is that simple. But at the time, it, we were at the lowest ebb in the church and in the world. And I'm looking right now and thinking, Lord, how much lower do we have to go before you'll do it again? How much lower can we possibly go before you will breathe once more on your church and bring something to change us all? And I believe he's going to do that. I believe all my life, from the get-go, that God is wanting to do it again. And in many ways, we are the people to be encouraged and to ask the Lord for that. Not for our sake, but for the sake of those who don't belong. For the sake of people in our communities who don't believe and don't know and don't understand the lost, um, in other words. So, there's our status. We're holy, we're declared not guilty, we're being changed, we're, we're holy. This is our status, it's given to us by God. I wear a wedding ring from, but I often imagine it's a signet ring given, given me by God, his authority. You know, the, the, the easiest thing as a preacher, and I, I enjoy preaching, is because I'm not preaching any message other than him. You know, I, I've my friend Chris is an engineer, and I've got another PhD here in biology. So, you know, very clever people. You don't have to be enormously bright to preach. You just need to understand the message of God. And you repeat it, and you repeat it, and you repeat it, because it's great good news. Come to Jesus and have your sins forgiven you. It is the greatest gift you will ever receive ever receive in the whole of your life. There is no greater gift than, than the, the gift of God who then gives you his inheritance. His inheritance in heaven forever um, and ever. So the second thing, okay, there's our status. That's what God gives us. I'm probably running out of time. Not quite. <laughs> but the second, what, what else does, is... is uh, Paul, well, Paul's showing us and what we're meant to look like. We're meant to look weak. How do we live weak? You see, when you're dependent on, on your own resource and what you've got, you've got a bigger church. I think it's harder for those with bigger churches because they've got more resource. They can keep that thing with courses running. They can do all sorts of things. Just keep that thing running. But we're to be dependent on God. And to be dependent on God is to be weak. It's to say, I haven't got enough. I can't do it. You know, got a fisherman here, Douglas. I, I'm sure when you go out for your cats, you pray. Fishermen are renowned prayers. One is because of the weather and the storms and the, the violence of those storms. And the other is the catch. Lord, I need to feed my family. I need a catch today or something. Dependency on God. That's what Paul had. He was dependent on God. And, and he was taken to the limits with the Corinthians to understand that. We're being taken to the limits. But so long as there's any part of us that thinks we can help God out, he won't do it. I know you're sick and tired. I, well, I don't know that you're sick and tired, but I would be sick and tired of people quoting from your own revival history, I'm sure. But it, it, it does spring to mind that when, um, you know, Peggy and Christine speak to their local minister, who's tried, you know, he's tried his big evangel, evangelical meeting, and he, he, he's tried to do all the good things. And they can try to say, well, well have you tried God? <laughs> have you tried God? And that, that, those words resonate with me. Because I live, you know, I, I live in the south of England where there, there, there's so much affluence. Yes, there's so much poverty, but you see the affluence. In my city, you know, young people love my city. The theatres, the nightclubs, the things to do. Of course, it's by the sea. The coffee shops, the restaurants, the, the lights. It's a glitzy city. I mean, on the, the outside, it's wonderful. My brother was a policeman in the city. He'll tell you, he said, Chris, I never look at that city like that. That's how I saw it when I came. He came with me to, 
help establish the church, he said, I never see the city like that. Because every day he's seeing suicides and hangings and drugs overdoses and, and domestic disputes and violence. Every day. That's what the police see in my city. It's a dark city that needs the light of Christ. That's the truth. That's the part of our culture that we hide and pretend doesn't exist. The pain and the hurt and the problems and the difficulty that Christ wants to come with, Dr. Jesus wants to come with his soothing balm of love and say, I can take the pain off you. I can heal that pain. I can fill you with this love. That's the answer. That's what God does when he breathes. He does something inside people that we can never, ever do. And so Paul is this tremendous contrast to a capitalist city in Corinth, to a successful church. Remember, the Corinthian church is successful. I mean, if, if you read its chapters, and you read the chapters on spiritual gifts, wow. I think most people would say, what a wonderful church. It's growing. Sick people are healed. We know that because the spiritual gifts are working. Healing and miracles and signs and wonders are all going on in Corinth in this church. People are being added to their number. Well, you say, well, what could possibly be wrong? Paul will be happy with all this, but he's not happy at all. Because the source of all this that comes from God, they do not understand what he's like and his character. And Paul wants them to understand as we must understand what God is like. And Paul uses this word. I'm almost going to, I, I think, finish with this. But Paul uses this Greek word um, in, in weakness. Um, it's asthenos. It's a Greek word. And the, the word stenos means strength. And when you put a pivot A in front of stenos, asthenos, it becomes weakness. A little bit like with atheism. Theism is, you know, to believe in God. Atheism, if you put an A in front, is not to believe in God. So you've got this, this word that is strength. You put a word in front, it's weakness. What Paul is saying, I've got no strength. Strengthlessness. I have no strength in myself whatsoever. Most of my life as a pastor has been God killing me. I never understood it. I was just like these Corinthians at the I went to conferences that were filled with thousands of people. I listened to a man who'd gone through the process of sanctification and redemption, who understood what God was like, but I did not. I was arrogant, I was proud, I was filled with the Spirit, I was joining something of thousands, and God spent most of that time destroying me in a kind way. My pride that I would understand, I'm not to have any strength whatsoever. And the times I've most seen God move are when I've got nothing. When I have come with nothing. And that's what Paul saw when he came here. That's what, that is exactly what Paul saw. So if you feel weak, if your church feels weak, praise the Lord. That's how you're meant to feel. If you feel, what on earth do we do? Praise the Lord. That's how you're meant to feel. You're not meant to have all the answers. You're not meant to have the strategy. He's got it. He's got it in hand. He's watching. He's, he's seeing. God knows. He knows everything. And he's preparing to do something quite incredible again. I believe in my city. Preachers always say they're going to close, don't they? Then they think of something else. But in, in my city, which is a large city, like I've said, it's probably 8 million tourists. It's full of glitz. It's full of, it just feels impossible. I mean, I've said to the Lord... I, Several years ago, my wife was praying for me at night because I, I felt, I just thought, Lord, it's impossible. How do you reach a city like this? You know, you've got churches that can grow. They grow to a 1,000 or 2,000, but they're all Christians. We're so stupid in the West. We, we, we have fool's gold. You know, they used to mine for gold in California. and There, there was fool's gold. It, it looked like the real thing, but it wasn't. It wasn't gold. The church is so enamoured with numbers, as if that's successful. But it's not. It's stupidity. It's foolish. It's, it's false God. We need the real thing. We have to go through God. And I remember that feeling. God spoke to me. I won't say how he spoke to me right now, but God spoke to me uh, two times that he was going to move. 
And do you know what gives me great hope is what he did here in Barbis in 1949 and on the Isle of Lewis. Because it's not pie in the sky thinking. Chris, you're pie in the sky thinking that God can do this or do that. No, he did it here. He did it here. And you are an encouragement to the whole world. The whole Christian world is encouraged by what God's done. Don't feel it's a burden on you. Don't feel it's laid on you. God will do something. He'll do it in a different way. But he will do it again. And he'll do it in weakness. He'll do it through weak people. He'll do it through people who've reached the end of themselves. Because that's what he wants to do. This is his heart. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He hasn't changed. All of your neighbours, your friends, your children. He wants them all in his kingdom. Doesn't he? He loves. With a love that we, we can barely comprehend God's love. There's no one he doesn't want in his kingdom. He wants everybody in his kingdom. And so I'll close with these words um, of Jesus himself, because from Matthew um, 11, uh, verse 29, when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. Jesus is giving you his yoke, which is not heavy, he says. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Praise God. You will find rest for your souls when you take upon the yoke from him. So I'd like us to stand, just before we do the hymn, just have one minute. We're just going to just close our eyes before the Lord and just talk to him. Share what's on your heart. Share what's on your soul. If you're not a communicant member, everything in me says talk, talk to this minister. If your sins are not forgiven, don't leave it. Two people I know in the last couple of months have died instantly. People I've known, people of 51, 32, have died. Don't leave it. You don't want to enter eternity and not you want your sins forgiven. Come and get your sins forgiven tonight. What do you have to do? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Confess your sins to him. You'll be saved. Take it away. He'll give you a brand new life, a better life. Now, is that okay to stand? Shall we stand just for a moment, just for a brief moment before the... And I guess in, that we can just do a bit of business with God on a one-to-one -one basis. Talk to Jesus. Talk to, the, talk to him. If it's sins you need to confess, confess your sins to him. If you're feeling burdened by life, confess it to him. If you need help, ask. Give it to him. Give it to him. Cast all your anxiety on him. Cast all your anxiety on him. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him. Cast it all on him. All your fears, all your worries, all your doubt. Cast it all on him. Because he loves you. And Father, I pray you take it off every single person in this room. And that you would reinvigorate them this, this evening. And pour your Holy Spirit into them. I know, of course, I don't know what we've said or what's spoken between you and God, but I know he knows. And I know he's going to answer. And I know he loves you, because I've read this book. So shall we close this evening and let's read, let's sing, The Lord is my shepherd, 1008, if you have the hymn.
serve the world.